a fortune teller. It felt like something else was in control. It wasn't me. Who communicated with spirits. I would see these spirits and they would talk to me. And dabbled in the dark arts. I felt a power, but it wasn't a good power. See how her eyes were open to the truth. You can't be with God and the devil at the same time. On today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, good morning and welcome to the show. Rapidly advancing technology is a way of life, and it seems that as soon as an invention or new device comes out, another more advanced model or idea is already underway. But is there such a thing as too much technology for our own good? Well, Epicenter, a company in Sweden, doesn't think so. In fact, they're offering workers microchip implants that function like debit cards. The cards, which are the size of grains of rice, are implanted into the hand of workers and allow them to open doors, operate fax machines and printers, and even buy food, like a smoothie, all with the wave of a hand. The technology itself is not new, as microchips are often used to track deliveries and pets. But Epicenter is one of the first companies to make the chips available for workers. The injections are so popular that Epicenter hosts parties for those willing to get chipped. <laughs> <laughs> really, 150 workers have the microchips so far and say they are excited to be part of the future. This would be great for you, Terry, because I, you know, oh, I sure. often see you sending a fax <laughs> and then moving down the hall and drinking, yeah. ordering smoothies yeah, from our right. CBN cafeteria. <laughs> I don't think you'd be signing up too quick for this. I you? don't think so. How about you? Uh, I don't know. I was thinking, is it much different? You know, we walk around here with a badge, right? Yeah. Except the other day I had to have someone help me send a fax. So, I, you know, maybe maybe I could just wave it and I'd be done with it. It's a little frightening. Well, it just makes you wonder what they can track. Absolutely. <laughs> Very true. Well, one of the good things about technology is being able to share a heartwarming story or picture instantly. And that's exactly what some students at a Wisconsin high school did after their principal, Jeffrey Miller, posed with some students wearing matching jeans. This is your place, Wisconsin, huh, Terry? Right. According to the student who <laughs> took creative. the photo, Principal Miller saw two students with matching jeans and gave them a little bit of a hard time, joking around with them about their paint-splattered pants. Later that day, the principal got a call on a walkie-talkie to come up to a classroom. They're still using those, I guess. <laughs> there he found the two students and a teacher with a bag and was soon seen sporting his own pair of paint-splattered jeans. <laughs> Principal Miller posted his own photo on Twitter, and he said, what are the chances that we all wore the same pants on the same day? <laughs> Love having fun with our students. It is amazing the amount of joy and laughter this has brought. And the pictures have gone viral and are encouraging educators to have some fun with their students. And for anyone who wants to buy their own pair of pants splatter jeans, I can attest to the fact, Terry, they are available at Rue 21 for 40 bucks. <laughs> Okay, we'll be watching yeah, tomorrow. I'll be tweeting tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, we have another story for you that has become a viral sensation. Shaden and his super cheesy promposal to his best friend's sister, Carly, thanks to his inventive use of her favorite snack. Carly, who has Down syndrome, had her dad help with reading the T-shirt message. Take a look. Oh you got a problem with me? <laughs> yeah? Is that a yes? Oh, here. Here. <laughs> Here's some Doritos for you. What are you doing? Thank you. And a oh. flower? Aww. Okay, turn this way. As for the Doritos angle, Shaden explained that Carly loves them with all her heart, and so he decided to use that as inspiration. How awesome Beautiful. is that? Beautiful. You know, so many times I, I have a number of friends that have children who have Down yeah. syndrome, and they are the sweetest, kindest, most genuine children in the world. So. You got yourself a good date there, yeah, Shaden. That's a beautiful story. <laughs> well, it is prom season, so we have another heartwarming promposal that's also gone viral. The video shows Rachel, a senior, asking Tyler, he's a sophomore with an intellectual disability, to prom. Take a look. Mom, would you eat some catfish and go to prom with me? Yeah. 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 Couldn't be happier. <laughs> wow, 
Shame he's not looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler's reaction has captured the hearts of the internet by the millions, and they've appeared on a few different news shows. Rachel said she'll be wearing a green dress, and Tyler will have a tie to match. What a wonderful reaction. Yeah. Two proms that are going to be celebrated in style. Did you look back at your prom times with good memories? Some. <laughs> Some. You know, for my prom, I was in a, a rock band, so to speak. And we, really? Yes, aren't you impressed? Wow. We, we played our own prom. You did? Yes, we did. Oh, well, that's fun. See, How that, cool did I that, feel? Yeah. Those days are long gone now. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't feel that cool at that. <laughs> Prom is highly overrated in I my opinion. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, while most students her age are planning to finish high school, 18-year-old Thessalonica is pursuing a Ph.D. in business psychology while at the same time training to become a private equity investor and Oof. a commercial pilot. Wonder what she does in her free time. She entered a PhD program at just 16 years of age, and that's when CBN Charlene Aaron caught up with her as she was trying to figure out what to do with that master's degree. Take a look. Um, I'm here to pick up my cap and gown. Yes. Preparing for graduation has become a common experience for 16-year-old Thessalonica Arzu Embry. This is nice shit. Oh, the school colors. Yeah. In 2013, Thessalonica made national headlines when she earned a bachelor's degree at age 14. Now she's graduating with a master's degree from Regent University. The Illinois teen majored in organizational leadership with a focus on strategic foresight, something she hopes to put to use right away. And that degree is to help businesses prepare for the trends that will impact them in the future. Thessalonica chose Regent because of its outstanding academic track record and its strong Judeo-Christian principles. We had a lot of offers from different schools, but we felt the Lord leading us to go to that school. It has that environment of the Word of God being taught there, and that's what we like. It was really an easy choice to let go of the Ivy Leagues and come to the Ivy League, uh, the kingdom of God. In September 2014, she began online classes and finished the master's program in just eight months. I thank God for giving us the wisdom and giving me the wisdom to help, you know, finish my schoolwork and, you know, take these courses and understand them. Her web classes were filled with students twice her age. Professors say while completing graduate level studies is a tremendous accomplishment at any age, it's amazing for someone at Thessalonica's age. A master's degrees, especially at Regent University, are very rigorous. We, we have a very high standard. We demand excellence from our students, you know, to glorify God at the same time. So these are not easy degrees to pursue. For students to graduate from a master's degree at that young of an age, of course, is, 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 is just a, an incredible gift. You know, I cannot, I cannot describe it any other way. Thessalonica Arzu. How does it feel to get your master's degree when you haven't even gotten your driver's license yet? Uh, I'm very excited and I thank God for the opportunity to certify my knowledge of organizational leadership. <laughs> Parents of the young prodigy say, Praise God. I'm so excited. It was an amazing journey. Very challenging, but God gave her the ability. Our favorite scripture is, we can do all things through Christ which strengthen us. Can't explain the feeling, but um, I think that um, I saw her work hard. I saw her uh, dedication, her motivation, her drive, her passion, and her excitement to, to complete it. But the biggest thing I got from it, that true prayer, she did all that. Jeremy, who is 25, completed his master's degree alongside his little sister. He says keeping up with her was no easy task. I feel very uh, happy. I support her. I pray for her. And I feel very glad for that opportunity to participate in this journey of academic success. With grad school now checked off of her list of goals, this girl genius says she is ready to take the next step. It's going to be a Ph.D. in aviation with a concentration in human factors. So that's also a psychology, aviation psychology, and that's to help businesses in aviation. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Ooh, I'm tired just listening to all that she's accomplished. Well, the impressive teen has written numerous books, has an IQ of 199 and a GPA of 4.0 in her doctoral program. And she will graduate this May. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That family is something else. Oof.
Man. I feel stupid. Yeah, <laughs> I feel real oh, stupid. Gosh. <laughs> what do you say? Uh, God bless that family. Amen. And they will make a real contribution, won't <laughs> yeah. they? Wow. Well, up next, a fortune teller and medium who thought her gift was from God. I would see these spirits, and they look like people, and they would talk to me and tell me about the person. I thought I was working for Jesus, and I thought I was helping people. We're going to see what put this medium out of business right after this. Well, at work, Maura Lanza was an account executive. But after hours, this wife and mother was a fortune teller. Maura actually thought she was helping people by communicating with spirits on their behalf. Until the day something literally flew off her eyes and she was able to see the truth. At 28 years old, Mara Lanz was a wife, a mother, and an account executive at a radio station in Tampa, Florida. She was also a medium for those seeking insight from the spirits. Well, different people that I met, I would see these spirits and they look like, like people, but they're transparent. And they would talk to me and tell me about the person and about their home life. Mara first heard spirits speaking to her at 13 while using a Ouija board with friends. But she believes it started before she was even born. In Cuba, my grandmother was a very renowned spiritist medium. When my mother was pregnant with me, she prayed over my mother's stomach. We would pray to the different saints. At 15, the lady that was babysitting me, she was involved in the occult. The lady my mom took me at 18 was involved in Santeria. I'm saying, okay, this is the way it is. I guess if you believe in God, this is what believing in God is. As she delved deeper into spiritism, she was convinced her gift was from God. I thought I was working for Jesus, and I thought I was helping people. Even the altar she built when she was an adult had Catholic symbols. It was um, like a triangle. I had a brandy sifter with water, a crucifix, and then the Bible opened to Psalms 23. I had cauldrons. Animal sacrifices were in there, and I felt a power, but it wasn't a good power. It felt like something else was in control. It wasn't me. Although Mara looked to the spirits for wisdom and direction, her life was in chaos and confusion. By her late 20s, she had divorced, remarried, and was without hope. I was very fearful. I was angry. My husband and I were fighting all the time. I always felt like there was an emptiness, a hole, something missing in my life. I even had thoughts of driving my car into a telephone pole and committing suicide. I'm like, I don't, I'm not happy. There's got to be something better than this. One day, Mara was filling in for the receptionist at the radio station when an old classmate walked in. He was now a pastor and was there to record a weekly program. He asked Mara if he could pray for her. At first, she gave it little thought. And I said, sure, you can pray for me all you want. And I'm, and I'm just smoking my cigarette. And then the following week, he would come and, and pray for me. I started doubting what I was involved in. Something was changing. And I said, Jesus, if what I'm involved in is of you, show me. A few days later, Mara was with her family and the conversation turned towards the Bible. And I said, I can, you know, I, I can read anything out of the Bible. I can read a Psalm, I can read any little verse, but I can never read anything out of the book of Revelations. And my uncle looked me dead in the eye. He said, that's because you're with the devil. And he said, you can't be with God and the devil at the same time. And I got angry. Mara went home determined to read through Revelation. I grabbed the Bible off the altar. I was going to start to read. The wall behind me started banging like ba 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 And I got scared and I started to close up the Bible. But all of a sudden, it's like this presence entered this room, like the, a blanket of peace. The noise stopped instantly. That night, she read the entire book of Revelation. When I read the last word, which was amen, literally something flew off my eyes. I had this knowledge, this knowing that Satan had used me and he had deceived me all of my life. And I balled up my fist and I said, I renounce you, Satan, all your works. 
the Lord said, now you're going to work for me. The love that flooded my being was incredible. That missing hole was gone. The next day, she called the pastor that had prayed for her. Together, they tore down the altar in her home. The Holy Spirit just came in in such an awesome way that I asked him to take that vision away. So I didn't see spirits anymore. I asked the Lord and he did, he took it away. As Mara read the Bible, prayed and attended church, she learned to give God control of her life and her husband took notice. He saw such a change in me that get, made him curious. So he started to go to church with me. He got saved eight months later. Today, Mara says she's found peace as she looks to God for guidance. I let Jesus take control of my life. Jesus took my fear. He set me free totally. It was His love that brought me to salvation. His love is everything to me. As I watch Mara's story, I think about you know, my grandfather's grandmother was a practicing witch and it had a control over the family until one day um, someone showed up at the family's home and preached the word of salvation and his entire family, the generations, began to get saved and become evangelists. And these things are real. You know, the devil tries to deceive us, woos us into uh, a distraction from God. And, you know, you may look at Mora's story and say, I'm not in that situation. I'm not in the occult. But you see how Mora was led away from the truth of Jesus Christ and the power she was looking for. That power is the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said to his disciples, it is good that I go away. And they questioned that. And he said, because when I go away, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the power of the Holy Spirit will be with you. That is the power. That is the spiritual power available to us, God's Holy Spirit. We get caught up in so much other nonsense. Sin comes into our life because the devil deceives us. He lays traps for us, doesn't he? It may not be the occult for you. It may be an addiction issue. But the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he did for Mora, desires to come into your life and break the bondage, break the chains that you find yourself in. And Mora's life, as a result, has been able to impact others. And, you know, you look at people, who would ever think that she was involved in the occult? But that's what Satan does. He deceives us. He woos us in. And he desires to distract us from God and the plan that he has for us. And I encourage you today, if you're feeling like you have wandered from God, maybe it's not the occult, but maybe it's some other lifestyle that you know is not pleasing to God, but you feel like you're too far gone for his love, for his grace, for his mercy, let Mara's story show you. She was literally serving and worshiping the enemy. And yet now she feels the love of the Heavenly Father. And now she has seen the power of the Holy Spirit available to her. And Jesus desires to comfort you, to love you, to show you his mercy, and to show you that he has a plan for your life. If you do find yourself caught up in something like the occult, we have some information that could help you. You just call us at 800-700-7000. We'll send you a free brochure on the occult. And it also is a good teaching guide to show about spiritual warfare and the powers that exist and to remind you that Jesus Christ breaks bondage. Terry? Well, still to come, Lee Strobel reflects on the new movie based on his best-selling book, The Case for Christ. To see your life put on a screen, not just um, random things from your life, but those emotional moments of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, to see that relived is difficult for us to watch. We'll take you on the set where CBN's cameras were the only ones allowed to go. You don't want to miss this exclusive when we come back. Lee Strobel was an atheist and a sworn enemy of religion. And then, his wife became a Christian. So he went on a two-year investigation to prove that her faith was a work of fiction. He never could have predicted how that journey would end. And as Ephraim Graham shows us, this real life story is now a major motion picture. There were so many reasons why I didn't want there to be a God, because I did not want to be held accountable. Millions read Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. The best-selling book is now a movie. 
I've spent my entire career as a journalist uncovering the truth. Until the day my wife presented me with the biggest story of my life. I'm not gonna lose my wife and my kids to something that I can't even reason with. And what happened next changed me forever. To see your life put on a screen, um, not just um, random things from your life, but those emotional moments of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the conflict that we had after I, um, Leslie became a Christian, I was still an atheist, the arguments. Mm -hmm. Uh, to see that relived is difficult for us to watch. There's a scene where Lee has this big argument with his dad, and that happened mm -hmm. on the eve of graduation for him. And when that argument was over, he came over to my house. So I heard all about it. But this is the first time I actually observed it. How can we even talk about historical evidence for the resurrection? The Gospels are filled with contradictions. The empty tomb is based on evidence. Lee and Leslie Strobel's real life unfolded in the Windy City, Chicago. But production of the film The Case for Christ happened here in the Atlanta area, what's often called the Hollywood of the South. The camera's going to move to the end of the show. Our cameras were the only allowed on set, a recreation of the Chicago Tribune newsroom, where Lee, an investigative reporter, began putting faith on trial. So you want your wife back? Well, hey, guess what? People in hell want ice water. Not everybody gets everything they want. Stop blaming me and the church and God and do your job. Stack up the evidence, follow the facts and write the story, win or lose. Actor Mike Vogel plays the role of Lee. He chatted with us between takes and still in his 1970s and 80s wardrobe. This is me doing Lee Strobel and my best Ron Burgundy, you know. It's been fun. It's been really and, it, and it's great as an actor whenever you get to do a transformation like this because it really helps throw you into, into the part. Lee's transformational story really begins the day his wife falls in love with another man, Jesus. Cough, baby. Cough, baby. Cough, baby. Oh. Okay. Okay. She's coughing. She's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank me. I'm a nurse at Mercy Hospital. She's going to be fine now. We are so lucky. Well, it's not luck. It's Jesus. <laughs> My husband and I went our way to another restaurant tonight. <laughs> Someone told me I need to be here. Leslie became a Christian, and Lee thought the, his, the, his world was ending. She dropped a bomb on him, right? He's this very much radical atheist who had no love for the church, no love for Christianity at all. And his wife comes home and says, I'm a Christian now. When Leslie told me that she had become a Christian, um, the first word that went through my mind was divorce um, because I didn't want to be married to a Christian. I was an atheist. I thought that uh, Christianity was based on wishful thinking, on legend, on mythology, on make-believe. And um, I didn't want her to turn into some holy roller or something that I didn't marry. I married the one Leslie wasn't in the deal to change, you know, this was, yeah. you know, so I thought I'm just going to walk out. But instead of walking out, he launches an investigation. The crucifixion of Jesus is one of the best attested events in the ancient world. There is no historical evidence of anyone anywhere ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Oh. And if you will, the final nail in the coffin, <laughs> this from the theory, is this. When the soldiers thrust their spear between Jesus' ribs, do you know what came out? Blood and water, which we now know is a description of pericardial effusion as a result of death by asphyxiation. And this is not a condition anyone could fake. And so to answer your question, yes, it is my medical opinion that Jesus Christ died on that cross. But beyond medicine and science, it's the heart of Lee's wife that leads him to the answers he needs. She refused to stop praying until her husband found the God she had. And it really was the positive changes in her character and values that uh, I found winsome 
and attractive over time. It used to be, you know, in the um, previous generations, apologetics was about putting somebody up against a wall and machine gunning them with answers. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about a story. It's about a relationship. It's about mm -hmm. conversation and dialogue and, and relating to each other. The love story that's at the heart of this movie is what really drew me to it. I loved the fact that this was a story that was taking a very honest approach to faith, but that the emotional stakes were embedded in a husband and wife who are separated by her belief and ultimately brought back together as he finds a common belief. This is a love story that raises the hard questions. If the resurrection of Jesus didn't happen, it's a house of cards. Without fear of the answers. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Atlanta. Worth seeing. Thanks for joining us. And we hope we'll see you here again tomorrow. Full show today. It was. Lots for people to ponder and think about and a good movie to see That's in the same That's a great movie. Time. We leave you with chapter 20 from the book of John. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. And as Terry said, thanks so much for joining us. And for Terry Muse, and I'm Andrew Knox, and we'll see you next time on 700 Club Interactive. Bye-bye.